Hello folks, and thank you for joining me for another reading. And, uh, my goodness. We have been digging and trying to decide which ones we're going to take care of here first. Alright, that's one of the shorter ones, and then this one too. We're going to go ahead and take care of this one here, and uh, I'm not sure what number reading this is. I think it's the 17th, the 16th or 17th, but I'll, I'll write it in the description box, and I thank you for joining me again. So let's get started here. Uh, the Statutes for the Government of the Royal Exalted Religious and Military Order of the Masonic Knights Templar in England and Wales, as resolved and agreed upon at the Grand Conclave held on the ninth day of December, 1864. And I have another book uh, that was printed by the Order of the Grand Conclave that's actually dated in 1812 that deals with the Templars. And I may get to that at another time, but I decided to go ahead and do this one first since it's a newer version. Um... And there's actually differences. You can see through the years the changes. And it's kind of uh, one of the Masonic rules, of course, is, is no innovation. There's a reason for that. No innovation. It was supposed to stay a certain way. And, of course, it doesn't. Nothing does. And uh, if you read the enough literature through the years of the 17, 18, 1900s, uh, you can see where the change took place and you can see which authors were the ones who, uh, you know, per uh, preempted or, you know, uh, helped that change uh, take place. So, statutes for the government, here's like a royal fancy writing, 1864, printed by the Order of the Grand Conclave. And the preface, the flourishing state of symbolic masonry under the protection of H.R.H., the Prince of Wales, afterwards George the Fourth. Grand Master and the great increase of the Royal Arch Chapters patronized by H.R.H. the Duke of Clarence, afterwards William IV, having animated the Masonic Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitallers of St. John of Jerusalem, Palestine, Rhodes, and Malta, now called the Knights of Malta, with a desire to revive their ancient royal religious and military orders, they confederated and unanimously selected their brother and knight companion, Thomas Dunkley of Hampton Court Palace in the county of Middlesex, Grand Master of the Confraternity under the patronage of H.R.H. Prince Edward, afterwards Duke of Kent, and on the 24th day of June, 1791, a grand and royal conclave was held at which the ancient statutes of the orders were revised, reenacted, and unanimously approved. So, right here you have the date of the reinstatement. Okay, we know that the church uh, outed the, you know, or so the story goes in, in the 1300s or 1307, right? Something like that. Anyway. Um, and you know, ran ran them, ran the Templars to ground and whatever and stuff. So here we have an official date, at least, uh, 1791, and the orders were revised, reenacted, and unanimously approved uh, in the more into the more modern era that we know now of of Templarism or whatever you want to call it. On the 10th day of April, 1809, a grand and royal conclave was held according to ancient form in pursuance of a warrant under the hand and seal of H.R.H. H. Edward, Duke of Kent, the royal grand patron of the orders, when His Royal Highness was pleased to conform, confirm the appointment of Sir Knight Waller Rodwell Wright as the most eminent and supreme grand master of the orders, and by the same warrant, he ratified and confirmed the statutes as then laid before the Grand Conclave. On the sixth day of August, 1812, H.R.H., the Duke of Sussex, was installed the most eminent and supreme Grand Master of the Orders upon the resignation of Sir Knight Walter, Walter Rodwell Wright 
and in the Grand Conclave he gave his sanction and approval to the statutes as revised in 1809. Upon the installation of Colonel Charles Kimney's Kimney's Tent th as the most eminent and supreme Grand Master in succession to the Duke of Sussex uh, at Grand Conclave on 3rd of April 1846, the statutes were again revised, confirmed, and ordered to be reprinted. At a, grand con at a grand conclave held on the 10th of May, 1861, William Stewart, Esquire of Aldenham Abbey in the co county of Hertz, was installed the most eminent and supreme Grand Master of the Orders in succession to Colonel C.K. Kimmy's tent when the statutes, as then existing, were confirmed. In consequence of many necessary alterations having been made from time to time in the statutes since they were printed in 1853, they were again revised by the Grand Conclave, held on the ninth day of December 1864, in order to be printed under the direction and supervision of the Grand Director of Ceremonies. In pursuance of such order of the Grand Conclave, and with the sanction and approval of the most eminent and supreme Grand Master, one have re one had revised and superintended the printing of this edition of the statutes. William J. Moyot says, I have revised, and he says, that's his sign, and he's grass, uh, the past Grand Captain, Grand Director of Ceremonies on the 30th of January, 1865, of the Grand Conclave. <coughs> Excuse me. The public interest of the order of the collective body shall be regulated by a general convocation of all the encampments on record in, in England and Wales and its dependencies, represented by their respective eminent commanders, past commanders, and captain commanding columns, with the present and past grand officers and the most eminent and supreme grand master at their head. This collective body is styled the Grand Conclave of the Royal Exalted Religious and Military Order of Masonic Knights Templar in England and Wales. The members of the Grand Conclave shall take rank in the following order, viz. the most eminent and supreme Grand Master, past Grand Masters, the very high and eminent Deputy Grand Master, past Deputy Grand Masters, the very eminent provincial and grand commanders according to the dates of their warrants, past provincial grand commanders, the grand seneschal, the grand, uh, past grand seneschals, uh, grand prior, past grand priors, gr grand sub prior, past grand sub priors, grand prelate, past grand prelates, first grand captain commanding column and second grand captain commanding column past Grand Captains of Columns according to the dates of their appointments, and the Grand Chancellor and Keeper of the Archives, past Grand Chancellors, Vice Grand Vice Chancellor, past Grand Vice Chancellors, the Grand Registrar, the past Grand Registrars, the Grand Treasurer, past Grand Treasurers, Grand Chamberlain, the past Grand Chamberlains, Grand Hospitaller, and the past Grand Hospitallers. The Grand Director of Ceremonies, the Past Grand Director of Ceremonies, Assistant Grand Director of Ceremonies, Past Assistant Grand Director of Ceremonies, Grand Superintendent of Works, the Past Grand Superintendent of Works, the Grand Constable or Marischal, and Past Grand Constables, uh, Grand Provost, Past Grand Provost, Grand Alamur, Alam, Almoner, Past Grand Almoners, First Grand Expert, Second Grand Expert, Past Grand Experts. First Grand Standard Bearer, Second Grand Standard Bearer, Third Grand Standard Bearer, Fourth Grand Standard Bearer, Past Grand Standard Bearers, the Grand Warden of Regalia, Regalia, and the Past Grand Wardens of Regalia. Uh, first Grand Aide de Camp, uh, Second Grand Aide de Camp, Past Grand Aide de Camps. First Grand Captain of Lines, Second Grand Captain of Lines, Past Grand Captain of li Captains of Lines, First Grand Herald, Second Grand Herald, Past Grand Heralds, Grand Organist, the Past Grand Organist, the Grand Sword Bearer, the Past Grand Sword Bearers, the Grand Banner Bearer, the Past Grand Banner Bearers, the Eminent Commanders, Past Eminent Commanders, 
captains commanding columns and past captains of all encampments registered under the Grand Conclave of England and Wales, taking precedence according to the dates of their respective warrants and or otherwise expressed in their respective warrants. Grand Inquiry, uh, the two assistant Grand Inquiries, every, and then number three, the every night regularly elected and installed eminent commander of, the, of an encampment registered under the Grand Conclave of England and Wales, who shall have exercised that office for one year, shall so long as he is subscribing member either to such encampment or to any other encampment registered under the Grand Conclave of England and Wales, rank as a past eminent commander and be a member of the Grand Conclave. For if any encampment which shall be have omitted to make its annual returns and payments on or before the 31st day of March in any year shall not make such returns and payments within three calendar months after being required to do so by the Grand Vice-Chancellor, the eminent Grand, uh, the eminent commander, past eminent commanders, and captains commanding columns of such encampments shall not be permitted in those capacities to attend and vote at any Grand Conclave until such returns and payments shall be made. The Grand Master may permit any knights of the order not otherwise qualified to attend any Grand Conclave as visitors. The Grand Conclave shall be held on the second Friday in the months of May and December. In each year, at three o'clock in the afternoon, the Grand Field of Encampment in London, a special Grand Conclave may be held at any time the Grand Master may think fit, and every Grand Conclave shall be convoked by the Grand Vice Chancellor by a circular letter addressed to each Grand Officer and past Grand Officer and to the EC of every registered encampment. The Grand Conclave, number seven, the Grand Conclave having been opened with ample form and with solemn prayer, the business shall be proceeded with as follows. First, the minutes of the proceeding of the last Grand Conclave and of any subsequent special grand conclave are to be read. Secondly, the reports of the committee and any other communications are to be read. Thirdly, the recommendations of the committee are to be considered. Fourthly, the several notices of motion are to be considered and in order in the order in which such no notices shall be inserted in the summons for the grand conclave. At the Grand Conclave, which shall be held in December, the most eminent and supreme Grand Master shall be elected by show of hands of the Knights present for the ensuing three years, if the term holding office shall have expired, and he shall be installed according to ancient custom at the ensuing Grand Conclave. At the Grand Conclave, which shall be held in May, the Grand Treasurer shall be elected by show of hands of the Knights present, and the Grand Officer shall be appointed and invested by the Most Eminent and Supreme Grand Master, and the Committee shall be appointed as elected and elected as follows. The Most Eminent and Supreme Grand Master shall be appoint four members, and the Grand Conclave shall elect by show of hands five members of such Committee. 8. Every special Grand Conclave, after having been opened in ample form and with solemn prayer, shall proceed to the consideration of the business for which it shall have been convoked, and no other business shall be discussed or transacted at any special Grand Conclave that, than that for which it shall have been specially convoked. 9. Any member intending to submit any motion or business to the consideration of the Grand Conclave shall give notice thereof in writing to the Grand Vice-Chancellor five weeks at least before the day on which the Grand Conclave shall be held, at which such a subject is to be discussed, in order that the same may, same may be laid before, by him before the Committee. Number 10. No motion shall be made or discussed at any Grand Conclave unless the same shall be inserted in the summons for such Grand Conclave, or unless the same shall be proposed by the Grand Master or recommended by the Committee, except any motion that the Most Eminent and Supreme Grand Master or uh, Past Grand Master shall make himself, I think is what that's supposed to say. Um, proper grandmaster. I don't know what PRO stands for, sure, sure. 11. Uh, every grand conclave may adjourn from time to time to a future day, if the business to be conducted thereat shall render it necessary. 
at a day shall end a day shall then be fixed for the holding of adjourned grand conclave and notice of the adjourned meeting shall be given by the grand vice chancellor if the day so fixed on will admit of it no business shall be discussed or transacted at any adjourned grand conclave except that left unfinished at the grand conclave from which the adjournment shall take place 12. Every knight present at any grand conclave must appear in the proper costume of his rank in the order. 13. On the day which the grand conclave shall be held, a banquet shall be provided at which every knight shall be entitled to attend who has previously sent notice of his intention to be present to the grand director of ceremonies. 14. If the Grand Master shall not be present at any Grand Conclave, the chair shall be taken by the Grand Officer present, who shall be next in rank and seniority, and if no Grand Officer shall be present, then by some eminent commander or past eminent commander to be chosen by show of hands at the meeting as the uh, pro Grand Master. Um... On all questions, uh, number 15, on all questions where votes of the knights present shall be equal, the Grand Master or the Program Master uh, shall be entitled to a second or casting vote. 16, every resolution of the Grand Conclave shall become law and be binding and conclusive and shall be carried into effect accordingly without confirmation unless the Grand Master or Program Master shall deem it advisable to direct a summons to be issued within one month for the holding of a special Grand Conclave for the purpose of reconsidering such resolution, in which case such resolution shall not become law nor be binding and conclusive nor carried into effect until confirmed by such special Grand Conclave. 17. The Grand Conclave shall have power to admonish, fine, suspend, or expel any knight who may break any of the laws or regulations of the order, but the fine shall not for any one offense exceed the sum of uh, 10 lira. I don't know what that was. Nowadays it's euros, but you know, back then it was what? I don't know what they have in Britain in the old days. I forget, but anyway pence, ten pence, or something like, I don't know, anyway, uh, on the refusal to pay the fine, the knight offer, offending shall be liable to expulsion from the order, all fines shall be applied for the purposes of the Grand Conclave, 18, the Grand Conclave shall have power to suspend or erase any encampment for any offense reported to the Grand Conclave by committee for general purposes, 19. The Grand Conclave may delegate to the committee for ge general purposes the power of deciding on and carrying into effect any matter which the Grand Conclave shall think fit. Of the Grand Officers 1. The Grand Officers respectively shall, on their appointment to any office, pay to the funds of the Grand Conclave the following fees of honor, viz. the Most Eminent and Supreme Grand Comas Master, Ten Guineas, uh, the Deputy Grand Master, five guineas, Provincial Grand Commanders, five guineas, and the Grand Sen Seneschal, and the Grand Prior, Grand Subprior, Grand Prelate, and First and Second Grand Captains, three guineas each. All the other officers, two guineas each. On promotion from one office to another office, a further fee of honor of one guinea will be payable to the appointment of a second captain or past second captain to the office of first captain for this purpose to be considered a promotion, N but no further fee is to be payable by any knight on his reappointment to the same office. <coughs> Sorry. Number two, all grand officers except the most eminent and supreme grand master shall be appointed annually by the grand master from among the subscribing members to some registered encampment and shall continue in office for one year except the Grand Treasurer who shall be elected annually at the Grand Conclave in May by the members then present on motion duly moved and seconded and by show of hands and any Grand Officer may be removed from his office by the Grand Master with the approbation of the Grand Conclave. Of the Grand Master 1. 
the most eminent and supreme Grand Master shall be elected for the term of three years, and may be re-elected from time to time at the end of each successive period. 2. On the death or resignation of a Grand Master, the Deputy Grand Master, or if there shall be no Deputy Grand Master, then the Grand Captains of Columns shall direct the Grand Vice Chancellor to summon a Grand Conclave of the Order, at which mo another most eminent and supreme Grand Master shall be elected. And at the next ensuing Grand Conclave in May, the newly elected Grand Master shall be installed and proclaimed in ancient form. 3. The Grand Master may of his own authority appoint provincial Grand Commanders for such districts in England and Wales, or any of the dependencies of the United Kingdom, as he may think fit, but no district shall include the County of Middlesex, which shall be under the special charge of the Grand Master. The gr 4. The Grand Master alone may be of his own authority grant may of his own authority grant warrants for the holding of encampments of Masonic Knights Templar at such places in England and Wales or its dependencies as he shall think proper. 5. The Grand Master may, if he th shall think fit, in the name of the order, apply to a Prince of the Blood Royal of the Un United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland or to the to a prince allied thereto, being resident within these realms, if a knight of the order requesting his acceptance of the honor of Grand Patron of the order. 6. All communications and applications to the Grand Master concerning the order shall be made through the Grand Vice Chancellor. 7. The Grand Master, or if the Grand Master shall not be present, then the Deputy Grand Master may, if he thinks fit, preside in any provincial grand conclave, or in any encampment he may visit, in which case the grand captains, if present, shall act as captains. If the grand captains shall not be present, then the grand master or deputy grand master may appoint either the captains of the provincial grand conclave, or as the case may be, the captains of the encampment or any other knights present to act as his captain pro tempore. Of the Deputy Grand Master, 1. In the absence of the Grand Master at any Grand Conclave, the Deputy Grand Master, if present, and also during any vacancy in the office of Grand Master, the Deputy Grand Master shall have and exercise all the powers, authorities, and privileges given to and vested in the Grand Master. Of the Provincial Grand Commanders, 1. The Provincial Grand Commander shall continue in office during the pleasure of the Grand Master but any provincial grand commander may resign his office. 2. Every provincial grand ma uh, commander, sorry, grand commander is by his patient invested with rank, powers, and privileges in his district similar to those possessed by the grand master, except such powers and privileges as by the statutes of the order are limited or expressed to be exercised by the grand master alone and except so far as the powers and privileges of the provincial grand commander are limited and restricted by the statutes of the order. And in case of the grand master or deputy grand master shall think fit to preside at a provincial grand conclave for any district, then the provincial grand commander of such district shall, during such pres presidency of the grand master or deputy grand master at such provincial con Grand Conclave take rank immediately after the Grand Master or Deputy Grand Master so presiding. And all, <laughs> and all powers and authorities uh, of the Provincial Grand Commander of such districts shall during the presidency of the Grand Master or Deputy Grand Master but not longer be suspended, but in no other manner and to no other extent, and under no other circumstances shall the rank, powers, or privileges of a provincial grand commander in his district be affected by the presence of the grand master or deputy grand master at a provincial grand conclave of such district. 3. Every provincial grand commander shall once in every year hold a provincial grand conclave at such place within his district as he may from time to time think fit and may appoint a deputy provincial grand commander and other provincial grand officers 
for his district, except the treasurer, all of whom must be subscribing members to some encampment or encampments within his district. And every provincial grand commander shall cause the names and residences of his all his grand officers to be annually forwarded to the grand vice chancellor. 4. The provincial grand commanders shall cause correct or yeah, shall cause correct minutes of all proceedings at provincial grand conclaves to be entered in the books to be kept for that purpose and shall if required send to the grand vice chancellor copies or and of and or extracts from such minutes. 5. Every provincial grand commander shall hear, shall hear and determine in such a manner as he shall think fit all manners of complaint against the encampments and irregularity on the part of any knights within his district and may proceed to admonish or fine or even suspension until the next grand conclave and shall transmit to the grand vice chancellor a minute or particular of all proceedings before him stating the compli uh, complaint or irregularity and his decision thereon and any other special matter he may deem necessary. 6. If the provincial grand commander shall not within a reasonable time proceed on any manner of complaint or irregularity, then such matter may be transmitted to the grand vice chancellor for the purpose of being laid before the committee for general purposes. 7. An appeal in all cases lies from the provincial grand commander to the grand master in the grand conclave. 8. The colonial provincial grand commanders shall have the power to grant temporary warrants for new encampments within their respective provinces provided that the attested copies of such warrants to ether with the proper fees are forthwith remitted to the grand vice chancellor for confirmation by the grand master nine every provincial grand commander must have some regular place of abode and be a subscribing member of some registered encampment within his district. Every provincial grand conclave shall fix the fees to be paid to the funds of the provincial grand conclave by the provincial grand officers of the district on their appointment to their respective offices. Of the Grand Chancellor and Grand Vice Chancellor 1. The Grand Chancellor and the Grand Vice Chancellor shall be eminent commanders or past eminent commanders of some registered encampment. 2. The Grand Chancellor or Vice Grand Chancellor shall have the custody of the seals of the Grand Conclave and shall affix the same to all patents, warrants, certificates, and other documents issued by the authority of the Grand Conclave as well as to such as the Grand Master in conformity with the statutes of the Order may direct. 3. The Grand Vice Chancellor shall issue all patents, warrants, certificates, and other endowments authorized by the Grand Conclave or directed by the Grand Master to be issued, and shall take care of the same as pre are, are pre are, take care that the same are prepared in due form. Number four. The Grand Chancellor shall have the especial charge of those counties which shall not for the time being be included in the district of some provincial grand commander except the county of Middlesex <laughs> and shall perform in all functions of a provincial grand commander of such counties and may if desired by the encampments holding their meetings in any such county hold a provincial grand conclave in such county and may appoint a deputy provincial grand commander and other provincial grand officers for such county in the same authorities and privileges and under the same regulations as if appointed by a provincial grand commander. 5. The grand vice chancellor shall receive the returns from the several encampments and enter the same in a book to be kept by him for that purpose and then transmit the same to the grand registrar and forthwith pay over to the grand treasurer all money remitted to him on account of the grand conclave and shall also receive all petitions, memorials, communications, applications to or for the Grand Master or other proper authority and attend the Grand Master with such books and papers relating to the Grand Conclaves as he may direct. <coughs> Number 6. 
Number six, the Grand Vice Chancellor shall keep a record of all proceedings of the Grand Conclave and of the Committee for General Purposes and shall issue all summonses for the Grand Conclave and meetings of the Committee. Seven, the Grand Vice Chancellor shall receive all notices of motions to be brought before the Grand Conclave and on receipt of each notice shall place a number thereon for the purpose of denoting the order in which the notices were received by him and shall lay the same before the Committee uh, before the meeting of the committee for that general purposes. 8. The Grand Vice Chancellor shall insert in the summons for the Grand Conclave all notices of motion which the committee for general purposes shall direct to be inserted therein, and all such notices of motion shall be inserted in the summons in such order as the committee shall direct. 9. If the committee for general purposes shall reject any notices of motion, as being improper to be made in the Grand Conclave, the Grand Vice Chancellor shall immediately inform the person who shall have sent such notice of motion that the same has been rejected by the Committee. 10. The Grand Vice Chancellor shall transmit to all the Grand Officers and Past Grand Officers and eminent commanders of all registered encampments immediately after the holding of the Grand Conclave in May and every year a list of the Grand Officers for the year, and of the Committee for General Purposes, and also abstracts or copies of the Grand Treasurer's accounts, and uh, of any special resolutions of the Grand Conclave, and shall also transmit all such other papers and documents as may be ordered by the Grand Master and the Grand Conclave, or as the Committee for General Purposes shall from time to time direct. 11. The Grand Chancellor shall sign and affix the Great Seal of the Order to all certificates of registrations of knights on receiving the fees payable for the same. 12. The Grand Vice Chancellor shall issue to each past Grand Officer, and also to each present and future Grand Officer, who shall require it, a diploma under the hand of the Grand Chancellor and the Great Seal of the Order of the appointment of such Grand Officer to his office on receiving the pay on the receiving the fee payable for the same. Of the Grand Registrar Number 1. The Grand Registrar shall register in a proper book to be kept for that purpose all encampments holding warrants under the Grand Conclave for England and Wales, specifying the dates of their respective warrants and the days and places of meeting and the names and place of abode of all the members of such encampments with the dates of their respective installments as Knights Templar and the numbers and names and places of meetings of the respective RA chapters to which they belong. And the number two, the Grand Registrar shall also sign all the certificates of registration of knights. Of the Grand Treasurer, the Grand Treasurer shall be elected annually at the Grand Conclave in May. The Grand number two, the Grand Treasurer shall receive all money payable to the Grand Conclave and shall pay there out all demands on the Grand Conclave and shall keep an account of all his receipts and disbursement disbursements. Uh, and shall produce the same with proper vouchers at the audit of the accounts in the month of April in every year, and shall prepare an abstract of his accounts for circulation immediately after holding of the Grand Conclave in May of every year. And that's it. That's all, folks. So I thank you for joining me. And I hope you join me for the next one.